All right, before we start the podcast, I have to shout out Vivo Barefoot. Now, the Vivos that I've been rocking and my entire gym has been rocking been helping our athletes and our coaches just gain full foot functionality, allowing us to still stay strong and still walk primal. So, you know, a lot of times with the new shoes, the Nikes and the Reeboks and all that, they usually tend to crunch up your feet, right? So you really don't get a whole lot of splaying out and allow yourself to get full function, right? So you can't base yourself, you can't have, again, full function, you can't create torque. And with the Vivos, it allows you to do that even with a shoe on. So a lot of times you see guys squatting barefoot or you know squatting with flat soles, which is good, but they're, sometimes they're not allowed to bring their toes out. And you really wanna get that large amount of surface area covered. And we can do that with Vivos. So let me see it, boom. So see how you have the large toe box here, right? You're allowed to splay the toes out accordingly. You can grab the ground, create torque, and then be more explosive and be more uh, forceful from the ground. So if you're looking to squat, you're looking to run, and you're looking to just be more functional as you're walking, I highly recommend you check out vivobarefoot.com and use my discount code DeRueStrong to get 10% off. Now, let's get on to the podcast. All right, guys, we're back. So I have the boxing crew here. We got Derek Santos, Maureen Shea. I do want to, you guys know Maureen, right? We've had her on plenty of times. We'll talk a little bit about what we have going on, but I do want to let Derek tell you guys how he got started in boxing and where you're at now and how things are going. So let's start off like from the, the origin story for me. Well, you know, um, as a child, I was always a fan of boxing. I was a fan of two things, mm -hmm. horse racing, Oh, wow. And boxing. That's interesting. I quickly realized as a first grader that I was going to be too big to be a jockey. So that was, <laughs> yeah. out, of, that was out of the uh, uh, question. Yep. And then I went to boxing. So my godmother, my whole family was into boxing, but my godmother is Wilfer Benita's sister. Mm -hmm. uh, he was the youngest champion ever in the history of boxing wow. at 17 years old. Yeah. Uh, multiple time champion, you know, mm -hmm. in the great era of, mm -hmm. you know, Leonard, yeah. Hearns, you know, Duran, um, B. Duran. Mm -hmm. um, so that had where my love affair started with boxing, you know, and I always kept thinking, you know, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can't do the other, obviously, then I'll do this, you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I started, you know, at first coming up, you know, in my youth early teens I didn't take it too seriously in the mid teens though I started to to take it more seriously so I, I fought as an amateur in the 90s mm -hmm. um, then I was invited uh, to main events camp here when they had it here in West Palm they had a great I mean just a great roster of guys that were under them Zab Judah Vernon Forrest Fernando Vargas yeah, yeah. Um, they had Galata at the time mm -hmm. Um, Joel Casamayor. Oh, wow. So you're so talking about you know right champions and champions. When was this champions. in the nineties? Yeah, this was in the mid nineties, nineteen ninety seven. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> right after the, the Olympics. Okay. Um, uh, me and a friend of mine, we had gotten invited there. Gotcha. Um, and then I, I, at that time, so the trainers were Ronnie Shields and Roger Broadwood. Okay. You know, and how did that all happen? How did you get the get the call? <sighs> To be honest with you, I remember it wasn't specifically that we got the call. What happened was that my friend was Golden Glove champion, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I was wasn't half bad. Yeah. You know, big for my size. Mm -hmm. You know, I was tall, four and forty-seven, and um, mm -hmm. one of the guys that was going to be managing us or sort of trying to help us out had some kind of connection and figured out that they were having a camp okay. over here, what used to be Steve Shepard's gym, which mm -hmm. is now Palm Beach Boxing. Okay. Um, and he got us the invite, and they were like, "Yeah, cool, bring them down, you know, and, and you know they'll work, you know." Yeah, yeah. Um, and we'll see, you know. At that time, they had a bunch of young talent, so they were bringing guys in. I, I, actually, they had signed a local guy, David Luter. Okay. Just prior to that, 
you know and so we just you know why not see the local talent type thing you know uh, unfortunately for me I got hurt right away wow. like, wow. like my wrist to blew out like all the little bones you know and uh, even went to, to uh, sports rehab and they were like something we can do for that mm. um, that's interesting <laughs> yeah what I noticed was that the 90s if you yeah. if you hit the bag right and you're pulling your punches mm -hmm. you're gonna pull your punch when you're fighting somebody so sure. I instantly started going if I'm pulling the punch you know mm -hmm. when I was a southpaw if I'm pulling the punch I'm gonna get hurt mm -hmm. in there and over the years I became a much better right-hander I learned how to you know do both yeah um, but back then I, honestly I sucked as a right-hander like yeah. my timing wasn't that great yeah. you know um, I was much better as a southpaw. I learned how to control everything. Are you a lefty better. or a righty? I am actually a righty that that Converted. that just was my brain, the balance, and everything worked out yeah. as a left hander. And the interesting story about that: my son, mm -hmm. who's a lefty, I mm -hmm. uh, couldn't fight left-handed at all. Mm -hmm. He was really good right-handed. Yeah. So I just think that's something with the way your brain is wired sometimes that's possible, with yeah. the balancing. Um, yeah. And I learned, like I said, over time to do both. Mm -hmm. But you know. Yeah, it's hard for me to turn righty. Like yeah. southpaw, even when I and I write with my right, so I do everything like fine motor skills, my right side. But then anything sports related, hitting a baseball, throwing a football, shooting a basketball, and southpaw is all left. But what I tell some fighters, there are some fighters who naturally can do both. There's always going to be a stance where they do better with a southpaw or orthodox, right? Mm -hmm. Then there's some guys that can fake it well enough. Right. Uh, for example, I had a, a former WBO uh, Pan Asian champion, Steve Gaffard, mm -hmm. who blew out his shoulder. Okay. Right. And so he was a very good right hand fighter. Mm -hmm. And when he came off of rehab, he still really couldn't throw that. But I said, you know what, come in, let's work southpaw. Yeah. So we just worked, you know, jabbing, jabbing, jabbing. We did three months of that. Yeah. By the time we were done with that, where he could go back to right handed, mm -hmm. He could fake it enough that if he had a hand injury, yeah. you know, he was pretty sharp with the lead hand, the lead hand uppercut, you know, the hook, you know, he could do it, you know, mm -hmm. whether he was going to throw a lot of combinations or move well like that. But he did it a couple of times in sparring and did it well. Yeah. So, and then there's guys who can't do it at all, mm -hmm. who, who just, it doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. I had a guy who was um, an NBA champ mm -hmm. who just, I tried one time, I said, you know, let's make this move where you, you spin out and come out left-handed and the, and it just didn't work. Gotcha. But if you're, as a coach, I, I'm always like, don't force things on people. Yeah. You know, you, you should have the good eye to be able to notice what some guys can do and what guys can't do. Um, every fighter and women, Sorry, I, I apologize. It. I was holding it in, I was holding it in. And women. I was holding it in. I was holding it in. <laughs> Already, and uh, it's yeah, universal. It's, yeah, it, but it's but it's okay. it's it's yeah it's it's uh I can understand. <laughs> Ladies are often sometimes forgotten in sports, and I can understand that. Well, I, I do shout out get, to the women's soccer team. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to get back to that and ask you a few questions on that. But let's get back into your story. So um, after that, I moved to Chicago, mm -hmm. and you know I had a child and whatnot. I moved to Chicago. And, but there was a guy up there who wanted to manage me anyways. And I started to train and I just didn't, you know, after a while you just kind of figure out, you don't have that fire in the belly. Mm -hmm. You know, I just didn't have it. I yeah. just didn't have that fire in the belly like I had prior to that, mm -hmm. always before, you know. What, what made you change? What, what do you think happened? I think, I, you know, I was going through some tumultuous things in my life child relationship with the girlfriend I had mm -hmm. trying to fix things my head wasn't really where it needed to be okay. um, and then you know once you start I was very disciplined in my diet and the way I trained and how many you know like I was always going to the gym I didn't miss the gym mm -hmm. and once you spend some time out of that yeah. you know you start eating good food and yeah. you start sitting down and uh, forgive me for anybody who's from Chicago nice town or whatever but it's not really an active town yeah and what I mean by that is if you're not particularly doing something specific there in exercise, uh, if you're in the city of Chicago, a lot of times the youth just hang out. Mm -hmm. and eat deep dish they, just, they just sit, you know, and you're eating burritos and great food. And the town's a great food town, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And you're eating and 
I went from walking around 157 pounds, 158 pounds, to literally in six months, mm -hmm. I was 199 pounds. I can see that. And so, like, you know, that I kind of pulled away from that. But the funny thing about boxing for me was, even when I was fighting, mm -hmm. a lot of my amateur friends would ask me to come watch them train mm -hmm. or they're sparring, and they would always say, man, you got good eyes. Yeah. Because I would give them good tips. You got good eyes. And when I watched boxing on TV, mm -hmm. people watch as fans. Yeah. Generally cheering, hey, I'm cheering for Kodo, I'm cheering for this guy, I'm cheering whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And I look back on it now, and I used to watch boxing in a very critique-ish way. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd watch them both, and I'd be like, oh, he pivoted, but he could have thrown a jab right after that, and he would hit that guy, and he didn't mm -hmm. do it. You know, oh, he missed that, that all day. What's he waiting for, you know? Mm -hmm. So unbeknownst to me, for whatever reason, my brain was already working in an analytical fashion, mm -hmm. breaking down things, seeing holes, the vision was there. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I look at it now. You know, I then went into training them, like helping training them. Uh -huh. And I liked it because they started to succeed. Yeah. And that got me hungry again. I took my son when he was very young to do Taekwondo. And I'm back in Florida now. I spent two years in Chicago. I'm back in Florida now. And a professional referee sees me and he says to me, hey, you still fighting? No, no. Oh, we're running this program, blah, blah, blah. Would you like to come, you know, once in a while? But stop by. Yeah. I ignored him the first couple of times. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I went one day, skipped a couple of days, went another day. Mm -hmm. oh, there was a kid who was very good. I don't know what happened to him, but he was very good. And his father says, he likes working with you. Can you come work with him? So I just started working with him first. I remember his first name was Luis. I just started working with him. He became a uh, junior Olympic champion. Lo and behold, I started showing up more. Kids started to get drawn more to, you know, this volunteer, you know, yeah. a lot of times in the amateur, unless you own a business, it's volunteer. I was volunteering my time. It went from going one or two hours to where I was volunteering five hours a day sometimes, four hours a day minimum, five days a week. Yeah. And the kids started getting drawn and lo and behold, you know, six months later, all of a sudden I'm like the head coach. And <laughs> that goes and evolves. Um, the other thing I that happened for me, and maybe smartly so, was there was a lot of professionals that started to ask me to work for them, but they weren't high-level professionals. And what I mean by that, listen, you hear trainers say they made a fighter. It doesn't work that way. It goes hand in hand. You could be the best teacher in the world, and I'll go back to the jockey analogy. You could be the best jockey in the world. If they put you on a nag, you're never gonna win a race, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it goes hand in hand. The fighter has to have an ability sure. to apply what you're teaching him, right? Sure. So what ends up happening is, I started telling those guys, ah, you know, I really don't have time for that. I really don't have time for that. After a while, I started getting invites to other high-level professional coaches and fighters and just sort of kind of like to be that bucket guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, we like him, you know, they like my personality, have him around the gym, you know. Yeah. That went from that to I'm going to do a couple, I can do a couple rounds of mitts with this guy, that guy. So it just started with me helping. Yeah. Um, and then I got, I wanted to learn everybody's job. I wanted to learn, what does the cut man do? Yeah. What does this guy do? What does the main assistant do? You know, what does the head coach do? What does the manager do? What does the promoter do? Uh -huh. You know, if there's an advisor involved, what's his job? And that's something that a lot of people don't do today. I hear head coaches sometimes ask me questions and they're like, oh, why is that? Mm -hmm. Or who does that? Or what's that? And I'm thinking to myself, how did you get to this position? Yeah. And you Not don't that. know what's going on under you. Exactly. Just like when you're running a business, you want to know the ins and outs of the business, right? So you want to know sales, you want to know marketing, you want to know all that stuff so that when you put people in place, it's not out of your world, right? So you know exactly what they need to be doing so that you can run them appropriately or you can guide them appropriately. And it's the same thing as a head coach, right? So you know all these things that need to be done so that if anything happens, you're like, well, you got to get out of here. You know what I mean? Exactly. So the idea of that is not so that you do all the jobs. Mm -hmm. It's like you said, it's so that 
you delegate the proper people exactly. under you, let them do their job. I have some good relationships with some good managers. I tell sometimes people from the outside, go, oh, but, but, but what this? Let him do his job. Mm-hmm. We are doing our job, let him do his job. Yeah. And then you also can discern which are the good guys, which are the bad guys. Sure. Unfortunately, uh, this the box is a little bit wild, wild west. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's a higher percentage of people just kind of flinging and slithering around. Yeah. But I've learned how to navigate through that because I know, you know, like I said, who's doing what. Mm-hmm. I can learn what the setup is already. Sometimes before somebody even offers one of my fighters something or they come to me, sometimes even the manager doesn't understand it. And when I explain it to the manager, he's like, oh, yeah, no, we'll pass on that, you know. Mm-hmm. So, but the other thing I did was, and I, and I say this, a lot of new guys are probably going to be upset at me. Nobody wants to put in their time anymore. I can't stand it. What do you mean, though? Like, what time? So, I spent years yeah. <laughs> being an assistant. Like, and, and I spent a lot of time learning those positions. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time working for free. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's like an internship, right? You go learning and working for free. I never asked for my first dollar. Yeah. When I first started getting paid, it was actually like, oh, hey, we should give some money to Derek, too. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then, you know, I made myself valuable. Uh-huh. You become an asset. Guys walk in the door right now and they walk in with their hand out. Uh-huh. You haven't made yourself an asset. Secondly, to the choir right second, <laughs> secondly, secondly, and more importantly, everybody wants to start at the top. Yeah. Man, do you really think like, I, I tell people, do you think that I didn't think I had ability? Mm-hmm. I knew I had ability, but I also knew I could learn from people. And along the way, I learned a lot of things to do and what not to do, a whole lot of what not to do. Yeah. Because even from good trainers that I worked under and, and you know, good other people, I learned like, oh, I probably wouldn't have handled that situation like that with that attitude or, or this or that or the other. I probably wouldn't have talked to that fighter that way because they're all unique. Some trainers train all their fighters identical. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to do that. So as it as I came up, that time allowed me to do that. Like, I'm going to say this because people who know me know I'm not very arrogant or outspoken. But damn it, if I didn't earn this, I earned my position. And it's not for everybody. Because some people are great assistants, and I know there's a lot of assistants out there in boxing who just don't go to that next level. They're just something, whether it's the analyzing, your creativity doesn't go, and then some people, it's made for them. It's like any job. Not everybody's made to be, you know, the boss boss. You can be, you know, you be the best at what you're doing. And if it's for you to make it to that other position, it'll be for you. Not because you asked for it, but because it developed into that. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of guys, like I said now, man, I, I've had assistants come in and out, and I'm like, hey, you know, I look at it my way. Come in, learn, you know. Mm-hmm. I always pay my guys because I always felt a little kind of way that, you know, give them something, yeah. you know, right? Yeah. And, you know, w- w- like I said, now every day, you know, now everybody's like, well, I can do that. Yeah. It's a lot to learn. There's a lot of nuances. No, for sure. What I did want to ask you was like, with boxing, right? There's a lot of old school mentality, and they got the new school mentality. What are some of the things that you see boxing coaches still cling on to, or let's say that are wrong in a lot of ways mm-hmm. that can be either done better or just pushed aside entirely? Well, you know, it's funny because I, people ask me, am I old school or new school? And I said, I'm a mix. Mm-hmm. Because there has to be an evolution to everything. That's just mm-hmm. natural. It's not revolution the way you make cars, the way you make food, the way you... So when people say, yeah, it's true. They didn't do mitts in the 50s and the 60s. That didn't start coming until the end of the late 70s, right? Yeah. But if you do it right, okay, the focus mitts are supposed to be so that you can tell a fighter, this is likely where the opponent's going to be. This is his head. It's not just punching. You know, it's not just working. Yep. There's technique behind that. I see a lot of guys who go out there, man, and they just that, you're just sweating. They're just throwing punches. It's they're, a workout. They, yeah, they're not really being told why. You're, they're, the guy's not stepping a certain way. You're not explaining to him these are your two options, whatnot. So there's a place for it. Yeah. 
You know, just like there's a place for the old school bag work. There's a place for, you know, getting back down to the fundamentals and the basics because everybody now is trying to be flash and dash. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, one, you have to let athletes rest too. I see a lot of guys out there, man, they just run their athletes into the ground. And here's the thing about that. You can leave it in the gym. That's what happens. If you overspar, you overtrain the guy. He might look great in the in the fight, and you get so many guys go. What happened? I mean, in the in the gym, and in the fight, they go. What happened? He looked great. Yeah. You know, and one of those reasons could be that. Yeah. I did want to talk to you a little bit about that because that makes because we've talked about this in the past and how we periodize our camps, and you periodize the sparring. You have certain times where you rev them up and then bring them down, just like everything. That's what we do in strength and conditioning. How, like, when let's just talk about sparring in general. How does the sparring look like? What does the sparring look like, like schedule-wise throughout the camp? Well, generally we start, you know, with four rounders. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, you know. And this is on this is a better. this is like if they're doing an eight, twelve round, whatever. Yeah. Right? So, you know, old school thought was always that if you were fighting let's just say 10, 12 rounds, oh, we got to do a whole bunch of those. Mm -hmm. I, that's crap. Mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I argue all day long against that because yeah. your fighter is getting wear and tear. We can get him conditioned and physically during bag work mm -hmm. and other exercises, other technical skill exercises. Mm -hmm. If a guy can do eight rounds of sparring, he can do 12 rounds in a fight. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, again, I went learning that trial and error as time went like why do these guys have to be so many times so long in the ring yeah you know and, yeah. and combating it's, it's not necessary mm -hmm. um but like i said you know you start generally at four mm -hmm. or five you know if it's a veteran guy you can maybe push to five you know and you'll have depending on how much time you got you have a couple of those sessions yeah and incrementally i usually will bring them up by two two rounds two rounds okay now, mind you, again, there, there's a certain point to letting your guy work through issues in sparring. Yeah. When I say that, I've seen, I've seen it because I would never do it. I've seen guys go eight, ten rounds of sparring, and they started to get whipped mm -hmm. in the fifth round, and it just became whipped for the next five rounds. I really don't see a point in that. Mm -hmm. Fighters have good days, they have their bad days, right? If he starts to fall off in round five, okay, I'm gonna give him six. I may give him seven. If by five and seven, he hasn't gotten a rhythm back Pull and he's getting tagged up, there's nothing wrong with stopping that sparring. Mm -hmm. You see, sometimes that's more of a coach ego thing. You know, we're not getting punched. So it's like, oh, work through it, work through it. Your guy's getting pummeled. I've had to tell some of my guys who have unfortunately been on the other side of that where we're pummeling somebody, mm -hmm. pull up, hit him to the body, don't yeah. hit him in the head because th the other coach is like, another round. <laughs> and I'm not going to disrespect another coach and say, you're doing it wrong because that's your fighter. Yeah. I'll shake my head inside my head mm -hmm. and I'll tell my fighter, just work your jab work your defense because it doesn't make any sense we're not out there trying to hurt somebody in sparring sparring's for work you yeah. know it's not out there for be killing somebody you know what I mean yeah. that makes sense and I've seen like you go from so we go four six eight yeah and then 12 back it off and you go you know, it's been a while since I've done 12 rounds yeah I used to do it in the past um and I sort of tapered that off to to maximum 10 rounds like yeah. I said I know any fighter out there, first of all, most of the fighters lose all kinds of track of the rounds when they're in there. Yeah, I know that. They have no idea. I've been asked 18 million times. You know, <laughs> and, and as a coach, I can admit myself. Yeah. I have sometimes told I you the, sec the other guy in the corner, like, <laughs> look behind me because I'm not paying attention to the ring card, girl. What round is it? Yeah. Because I'm so focused yeah. on the fighter, I will lose You've track. asked me this in the corner. Well, yes. And, and, I can remember it happening in the Barrera Joe Smith fight mm -hmm. where I was so focused on controlling Sullivan and keeping keeping that fight yeah. the way we had it yeah. 
that you know even when they came and it was like oh it's round nine i'm like oh yeah. you know we're already this deep into the fight sure all right so i have a lot of snc coaches and we work together for what three four years now something yeah. like that can you give them a kind of a rundown of because i get this a lot with a lot of the coaches that i mentor ask me you know how do i communicate with my boxing coach he doesn't understand what i'm trying to do what do you see as a boxing coach that you would want to see from a strength and conditioning program and how they go about training people well the thing with the strength and conditioning for me I, i've always said this um it, it's meant to be a compliment mm -hmm. right when you're talking about boxing it's meant to be a compliment to it right so what happens is i'll look at a fighter individually and maybe i'll see something where i'll go to the strength and conditioning coach and say hey I'd like to work on this. Mm -hmm. I'd like to work on the other. Depending on obviously what sport you're working on, but with boxing mostly, you, you want fluidity and yeah. flexibility out of your fighters, right? And you also want the fighter to obviously be conditioned. Um, I've had some good relationships with strength conditioning coaches, and I've had some unfortunate ones where I've had to let them go because I'll tell them, hey, you know, I need to work on this. No, 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 I just want to make a tank. I'll make him a tank and I'm like no that's not what boxing is yeah it's not what boxing is I've seen guys that don't have a cut on their muscle whip the hell out of somebody else you know what I mean so it's like that's not what that is we need to mesh that together whether it's you're working on something with his hips right mm -hmm. um, we've talked about that before you know with the flexibility or well, I'll see you know like oh it might be something with his legs, it might be something, you know, with his, with his breathing, and we've come together and kind of figured out what we need to do with that. But it definitely is to be a compliment, you know, and I, and I don't say that with any disrespect to any strength conditioning coach, because they play a vital part. I say, I say it in the fact that, remember, it's a compliment. Yeah. So you have to try to work that relationship, it makes sense. In you know? any strength and conditioning coach, in combat sports thinks that they're running the show they're sadly mistaken right so like anything that you tell me to do based upon what you see in the ring because you're with them 24 7 mm -hmm. i'm gonna hold that in high regard right and i've never done i've said okay whatever we need to do right you know and then the good thing is that we're in the same gym now so i could see sparring right and i could be with you right. when we are going through like today we had sparring today which was perfect and we work together us three for a long time mm -hmm. but you have also mma guys bare knuckle guys right what's the difference like what's the main difference from a coaching standpoint from mma boxing bare knuckle okay so let me start with the mma guys mm -hmm. okay with the mma guys what i noticed is and, and again i mean no disrespect because i know that there are a lot of mma coaches out there doing their part I do my part also, right? So I fit in there somewhere in that puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. The biggest thing is that what I notice in, in the evolution now of MMA is the better fighters are putting combinations together. They're using good jabs. That's boxing. Mm -hmm. They're going to the body I, more. I, yeah, they're going to the body more. <laughs> I have a very sort of um, uh, not liking relationship with the word strike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the and the reason that's such a word that we with, use. the reason why I say strike that is. is because strike is singular. So when they say the guy is a striker, uh, it, that's singular. It means he can throw that's one good punch, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, there's so many MMA guys out there who can do so much better than that. They can yeah. put their punches together, yeah, right? Yeah, and there's no other word for that. That's the boxing discipline amongst the many others that they have to put together. MMA, I will, I've learned to give it a lot of respect because there's so many different disciplines there. Mm -hmm. And so you have to, as a boxing coach, you have to keep that in mind with an MMA fighter. There's certain punches and things that you, you have to be careful with. There's knees and kicks coming. Yeah. So you have to position them a certain way. But the biggest thing I deal with them is putting punches together and using their jab a lot, yeah. which a lot of times they don't, you know. And I've had some pretty good success, you know, with, with the guys, you know, there's also, like, again, there's so many variables in MMA. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you know, I've been in corners where guys are, you know, I don't generally work a lot of MMA corners, but I would tell you, I've been in a few where my guy's winning and then there's a slip, a choke hold comes, and I'm like, damn, where that in boxing, if you have a control of a fight, your job is just don't mess it up. Don't do something stupid, you know, like where it's just a lot of variables. Now, the bare knuckle. The thing with bare knuckle is, one, you definitely have to use the technique of defense, right? Mm -hmm. Learning how to roll, learning how to slip, yeah, there's a lot um, don't learning how to be a little more patient at times, you sure. know, not just lunging. It's not a street fight, man. Guys, there's, I've seen guys out there, it was a street fight. Nah, that's what they used to say about MMA when MMA started. I believe that that's why MMA got such a big fan base to begin with, because yeah. people could see Sugar Ray Leonard and say they know they couldn't do that. Yeah. But you had that young demographic who went to the bar and, and saw elbows and kicks and knees and said, I, I can do that on the street fight. The, the, of course, they're totally off. They're totally wrong. But in any case, with the bare knuckle, right, you have to be careful with the hands. You know, you have to be a little more efficient. As in what, though? Just like... The I, way you punch. Yeah. Because you can break your hands very easily. Way easy. Very easy. That's like almost um, like a Counter punching... <laughs> So in boxing, right? Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, listen to what I'm about to say. Counter punching is not a style. It is a tool. Yeah. It is a tool. Counter punching, people always want to throw a Floyd. Man, you don't know what you're watching. Yeah. Floyd controlled his fights. He went forward. He switched from the half guard to the shoulder to the conventional style. Yeah. Floyd used perfect timing for countering. He did not just sit back and wait and wait and wait like a lot of young fighters are trying to do now. Mm -hmm. I'll just sit back and let that other guy do it first. Yeah. You be first. Mm -hmm. You find that control. You start landing your jab. You find your timing first. Mm -hmm. Again, counter punching is a tool, right? Now, in bare knuckle, I believe that counter punching can be an even more effective tool mm -hmm. than in boxing because when these guys punch, man, their hands hurt. And sometimes they'll punch two, three times and they'll start punching less. The timing, they, a lot of these guys are lunging and they're reaching. So if you can get really good time, if you can get comfortable in that pocket where you push back, let's say off your lead foot, six inches back, and you can counter that guy who's lunging in, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's a little bit different rhythm. Yeah. But I work a lot of, a lot of rolling, slipping, a lot of coming, punching up from the angles, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and definitely, like I said, just the timing of it, just knowing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and what was the other one you asked me? So we got boxing, bare knuckle, and MMA. I was also gonna ask you, like, with MMA, same thing with me, we always gotta take into account all the other training demands that they have to do. Of, so of course, when you do their skills training, a lot of the times when you're, you know, holding pads or, you know, just watch them hit the bag or even sparring sometimes. It's not long. It's not long, right? It's not long. I, I my guys come in, Maybe our training session is 30, 40 minutes. Yeah. It doesn't need to be longer than that. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I start them on the three minute. Yeah. And as they get closer to the fight, then we'll go five. to that five minute. Yeah. And maybe we'll do five fives, right? Yeah. So that's 25 minutes. Yeah. He doesn't need more than that. What they do need though, which what happens, which is lacking in a lot of gyms all over this country, is communication. <laughs> You need to explain to the guys what, why, when, and where. And so you see these guys, they're working, they're working, they're working, and then you see guys never really tell the fighter why he's doing something. When is it the time to do this? Because it's completely different. It's all situational. Combat sports is specifically situational. Yeah. You know, so it's like, when I see that and I see other guys training again, you know, to each his own, but I watch and I'm like, okay, yeah. He made him for 20 minutes and he never once told him, step over with both feet. Yeah. Your angle's here. Mm -hmm. This is the shot that you're looking for. This would... So exactly, Apart from sweating, and he could have done that in the bag. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. What are you doing to better 
the athlete. Mm -hmm. You know, to communicate. Mm -hmm. Communication's a big part. If you, if you're not a good communicator, in my opinion, you shouldn't be a, a head coach. Period. You should yeah. probably shouldn't be a coach if you're not a good communicator. Yeah, it's it, it's funny because we we're similar in the way we coach. Like even if I'm putting somebody underneath the bar or we're doing some type of plyometric drill, there always has to be a correlation and there has to be some reasoning behind it. So you should have an answer for every question that you are asked. And there should be some teaching going on as you're in the room training. Sure. You do that very well, especially with the pad work. You know, it's not just like, just let's get to work. And I think that's why a lot of MMA guys like to come to you because of the fact that they know that they're getting better from a skill set that they actually need that's lacking in MMA a lot of the times. There's only like a handful of good guys, and I can name one of them that I know personally that has better boxing than a lot of people because they've been around boxing sure, gyms and sure. they, you know, and they, they like to ask questions. They, they study, that's yes, what I'm saying. They absolutely do, yeah. And they love boxing. You know, and I think that's missing in MMA. I don't know about bare knuckles so much. Obviously, you have a lot of street fighters in bare knuckle, per se. A lot of guys coming off the street. I'm not a street mm -hmm. fighter, but coming off the street. And I think that bare knuckle, and it's funny, we were talking with um, David. David, and uh, and I was saying, like, the level of skill is going to increase. Sure. It's evolving. When yeah. everything, you know, comes to play. And you're going to, you know, the, the sport itself is going to, everybody's going to, increase their value it takes a lot of guts to do any combat sport and and bare knuckle um you know obviously you're likely not going to come out of that unscathed whether it's no, a hand injury no or a cut so you know i give all those guys respect for even going um that route whoever chooses to go yeah. that route um but you know going back to that that communication thing i think that Combat sports is an imperfect sport, right? So when people ask me, man, they say, you, you see, you're really detailed. Sometimes you're telling that guy the four points aren't turning, the rotation. You're turning your hip and your shoulder, but that the ball of your foot, your toe is not turning with that punch. And they're like, oh, you stop them sometimes and you say. The point, my job, the reason I get paid is to remind you, okay? A fighter can fight. A good fighter can fight. Yeah. The job of the team, while they're coaching him, and the job of the team more intrinsically in the professional fight mm -hmm. is to make the adjustments. The fighter can't. At times, you'll get a smart fighter who will make adjustments. But the fighter can't see everything. I know because I used to box. So you get in a zone, right? And when you're in that zone, sometimes you don't see that this guy's moving this way or he's open all the time. That's the job of your corner. Yeah to sort of guide you and have that relationship where the fighter knows, okay, he's saying do this, you know. I understand, man, sometimes in fights, fighters will tell you after, you told me the right thing, I just couldn't click in yeah. to, to do it. But, again, getting back to that, why am I so detailed? Because the idea is just to minimize them. All your fighters are gonna get hit. Yeah. All your fighters are going to make mistakes. All your fighters are going to lunge. Yeah. All your fighters are going to miss windows that you clearly see from that corner. Yeah. The idea is to minimize them. Look, man, I've worked with some excellent fighters and champions and whatnot. If you can get a guy to 70, 75% of the time, you know, pretty much be in, in, in a good technical form and his zone and he's got that skill set, mm -hmm. he can be world champion at that. I've never seen a boxer go out there and say, oh, he's 90%, he's doing everything right. Mm -hmm. Never. And that's not even close to 100. So it's not, never. I don't know that I've ever seen a guy do it 85% of the time or 80. I would say probably 75, yeah. you know, is, is, is what I've seen. And, and like I said, it's I've been be fortunate perfect. enough to to be in gyms with unified world champions, to be in corners with world champions, and you know, they, it's it's a fight. Mm -hmm. So you're going to make some of those mistakes. You yeah. just have to minimize them. That's why I'm so detailed about that. Well, we do have one that's pretty detailed and uh, stays on point. Miss Maureen Shea, what do we got coming up? Hopefully something, right? Well, yeah, we have April 21st in Houston. Mm -hmm. It's been a bit. Um, I'm excited to come back. And it's yeah. funny because a lot of things that Jared was talking about, you know, even with his own personal experiences with losing the fire, mm -hmm. being out for two years myself, it was part choice, part COVID. And, um, you know, 
but I feel now it's, it's a really I'm in a really interesting place because I feel like I constantly reinvent myself and you've seen me throughout the years you know I know Derek's seen me throughout the time that I've been working with him and anybody who's watched me or fans that have watched, have you know supported me throughout my career I mean 16 years professionally mm-hmm. have seen my evolution and um, I'm excited now to reinvent myself in another way at this time in my life as a fighter I, I, it's funny like reinventing is one thing um evolving is another too as well i think you evolved and you're you're at an age now that like everything's on point like you know how to schedule yourself you know your body in and out good thing that we're here we always have a good communication we always have good communication we always have a good team aspect going on now when when you're training now how hard is it to recover from most of your training sessions being that you are up in age you know, it's it's not. I mean, I have to say, it's more like how I how I schedule my day. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, I work for you as well. I mean, I, number one, it's the support that you guys give me, and you include it as my boss. You know what I mean? It's almost weird to call you that, but yeah, you are. Yeah. And you, but you support me, and you let me get my job done. But you know that I will get my job done. Yeah. Same thing with Derek. You know, Derek travels with other fighters, and I said to him, I said, I said to him yesterday, I said, you don't have to worry about me. Like I'm yeah. always gonna be on point and do what I have to do because that's my responsibility as a fighter. Mm-hmm. Any other fighter out there that that depends too much on their coaches, mm-hmm. they need to wake up and realize it's not on the coaches; it's on them to do their work, and they have to know it. So for me right now, I think when I have my schedule correct, it's it's super important. However, I've always been a sleeper. Mm-hmm. I've always been meaning. I've always gone to bed really early. Mm-hmm. You know, it goes back to when I first started boxing when I trained in Brooklyn and I was in college. So I always knew how to manage a schedule. I was in college, mm-hmm. I was boxing, and I was working. And I had to maintain an academic scholarship. I had to maintain a certain GPA. And I was told I couldn't do it. My father told me, in this house, you have to work and go to school. You can't do all three. I said, watch me. And that was my drive. Sounds like you. It, that was my drive to do it. And that was like, okay, how am I going to do this? And it got to the point where I think managing my schedule and managing my time was the most important to be effective and efficient at what I need to get done. So getting up in the mornings, I was always getting up at like 5 a.m., you know, preparing my meals. Um, packing my cooler in, my, in the trunk of my car, you know, driving to Brooklyn or on days that I couldn't, you know, I was, I tried taking a bus in the trains. If I didn't have to go to college that day, I would try to, uh, you know, even financially trying to make it work. So I think going down to Brooklyn, I would get my training in boxing and then I, and I trained with a very old school coach. So going back to what you guys talked about, he didn't believe in me drinking a lot of water. He would try to watch my food. I'm like, you don't know anything about this, you know, and then I would go and I would run four miles. So I would spar, train. How about the, how about the paper towel incident? Let's talk about that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I forgot my mouthpiece. Hector Roca, for all of you that want to know who it is, and everybody knows because you know Hector, this is just a, this is his MO. Um, yeah, I, I showed up without my, my mouthpiece. I couldn't find, actually somebody in the gym, I think, took it, and I couldn't find it, and I was sparring, and you have to stand back then, it's like you show up. You don't get to, you saw, oh, here's your plan for the week. That's why I'm so obsessed now with being able to know because it made me a better fighter. But back then, I didn't know. Yeah. It was like, all right, you're going to show up, you're going to spar. So I would spar back to back to back. And I didn't know how many rounds I was going. Mm. So I showed up at the gym and I was like, all right, I had all my gear out because I was always very detail oriented with my stuff. And I'm like, where's my mouthpiece? I couldn't find it. And, and Hector looked at me. He's like, okay, go get the paper towel. Wet the paper towel, put it in your mouth. I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He made me a paper towel mouthpiece, put it in my mouth, and I sparred. I mean, <laughs> you're going you're gonna, to you laugh about that, but. <laughs> I've actually had three world champions spar <laughs> with, 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 with a paper mouthpiece. Now, mind you, they did not tell me before oh. that that they had a paper well, mouthpiece. Put, yeah. But they they weren't gonna they didn't want to miss their work, yeah. and so they take a paper towel, they fold it, fold it, fold it, pack it, it thick, it. sweat it a little bit, yeah. and mold it and around their teeth and bite. Yeah. I, I I had uh, you know. Chris Algeri, Sullivan Burr, I do it before, yes, you know, like they, they, and then laugh after because they tell me I'm looking at them, like after the sparring, you know, and they'll be like, yeah, I forgot, you know, something happened or, you know, yeah. um, just to name a few, but I know I've had it done in, in the past. It's obviously uh, not something that's recommended, but, you know. But you know what it teaches you? But I think, they can do it. I think for me, it was like, it taught me like, you know, no matter what happens, you figure out a way. Yeah. I think that's what it gave me, whether it was good or bad. Yeah, obviously it's not recommended, but you know what? That taught me something. Yeah. You know, it taught me like it wasn't because I even if I forgot it. Okay, I'm never going to forget it again. Champions adjust. I, yeah, and I, that's I've, what you have to do. I've heard of that in uh, actually some of the countries where you know it's not readily available. Yeah. You know the equipment. Some of the second and third world countries that are still doing boxing. Mm-hmm. Um, I've actually heard that that. They looked at me and said, oh, yeah, I've done that before, you know, and but I'm I like, think, wow. I think a lot of times, like I said, it, it depends on the coach. So I think, you know, I've had multiple coaches throughout my career, but I think working like that situation, then after that I'd spar X amount of rounds, and then I'd have to go run. I'd run the Brooklyn Bridge. 
Now, I hated the treadmill. So for me, it was like, okay, I gotta, I put on, packed on all my clothes and I would run the bridge. Mm-hmm. And then I'd have to get, so back to what you asked me, it's about really managing your schedule. And then I would get home, I was so tired. Like, imagine a day like that. Okay, I'm in my 20s. That's still a lot of stuff. Yeah. So then I'd have to go to school, work my brain, mm-hmm. and then go work if I personal trained or I was teaching uh, boxing fitness classes or mm-hmm. something like that. And then I would go, um, I'd go home and I was in bed at like 9.30 at night, nine o'clock at night. So I've been doing that since I was really early on in my life. Oh, I know. So I can, I still do it. You know what yeah, I mean? So it's, yeah. it's the recovery, I think. How did, um, how did that work though when you were fighting late night though? Like, you know what I'm saying? Obviously there's a difference. You, you know, going to sleep adapt. at that time. I didn't, I never, you know what? I didn't know, I never thought about it. You know, when I went in there, I just never thought about it. All I knew was fight. So it didn't, I mean, could it have but been? But did you take like a week and you were like, all right, I'm going to go a little bit, go to sleep a little bit later nope. up into the fight? I didn't know. No. So I just did what I had to do. Oh, I would travel, go to different places and fight. I was in Belgium, you know, training out. I was training and then I, I was supposed to fight in Belgium. That's another story. My fight got canceled at the ring walk. Yeah. That's crazy, you know, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that stuff. You got to say like, it's I good to know because we're not going to do that. We're, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get you acclimated to the time. <laughs> but that's the thing, like you just, you kind of just, you, you, I get it, but yeah, no, it's I know, better but, if we course. have it structured. But, yeah, but they don't think they thought, of, but you got to stand too. You got to realize. And I know you guys, that's why you guys talk a lot about the guys, the guys, because the guys have been around doing it longer Universal than the term. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, the guys have been doing it a lot longer. So we, yeah. we were always kind of on the back burner. And, and people didn't give, I mean, yeah, they trained us, but they didn't give us really, uh, the females didn't get like what they're getting now. Well, well, first of all, like there's not a lot of females in the sport. So guys aren't used to, and I was gonna ask you about this one too, mm-hmm. the difference between males and females and how to train them. I have my way yeah. and I know you have yours. Sure. This is gonna be good for you, but how would you actually, especially for all the coaches out there, how do you train them differently? If you do at all? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, there's a certain different movements that a woman's body makes, mm-hmm. you know, um, even when we're talking about defense, you know, their hips, certain movements that they make, a little bit different. Um, the time is different. The amount of work that you're putting in um, yeah. as far as, and I don't mean as far as hard work or not, but just the time. Mm-hmm. You get this debate now, you know, between the three and the two minute, you know, because mm-hmm. women fight two minutes. Yeah. Um, I don't see the point of them going to three minutes. First of all, they're not paid well enough to do so. Mm-hmm. And secondly, um, the fights are, are exciting in the, in the two minutes that they are, you know? Um, right. So knowing that as a male coach, you have to understand, right? Again, don't take this the wrong way, any ladies. They're, they're just, they can be mentally as tough as the men and whatnot, and mm-hmm. even physically to an extent, you know, if, if we're looking at yeah. you know that but there's a different way to, to train them you know there's a different the, the physiology of a woman's body is different you know and she's also going to be going obviously through things that male fighters don't go through mm-hmm. while they're training yeah. you know hormonal coach in, I ever talked to about in, my period <laughs> right so like y- you have to understand that okay you don't need to sort of whip them sort of like a like you know you're flogging them like a horse going down the stretch you don't do that you know um and again you talk to people differently i talk to every guy fighter differently i talk to every woman fighter differently um i understand different things that you're dealing with it's always good to know you know to have some kind of relationship um you know obviously you don't have to be a babysitter for anybody but you have to have a relationship because a lot of things that happen sometimes outside of the gym too mm-hmm. male for the males and the females and then you start wondering why is this guy or this one sort of kind of falling off or something going on so it's always good to know yeah. what's going on a little bit in their life um you know maybe give them some advice and things like that but the biggest thing is understand the physiology is different too you yeah. know and i think that i'm not 100 percent sure um how deep it goes but i know there's a difference even in in when we're talking about water and women's brains and men's brains and and the effects that the punches have Mm. on them and Mm. so that is also actually something that you also have to you know take into consideration especially when you're talking about sparring Mm. right and you see sometimes where because there's lesser women so i've seen some women in there Spar men, yeah. you know, and that's fine. Yeah. But then I've seen also men, you know, taking off and 
dogging the women and the coaches are, well, that make her tougher. No. Yeah. What are you doing? Yeah. What are you doing? There's no, she's not going to face anything like that. Mm -hmm. So why are you breaking her down like that? That, 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 that word right there, you said about breaking that, that what I felt a lot because I don't think the men, and I'm not blaming the coaches, I don't think they knew how to train women. No, I know. That's and what that, I'm saying. That's not a lot of they men They didn't do. know how to. Yeah. And I was really grateful. Um, you know, it's funny because I was always like, I mean, a lot of it is to break. And sometimes I felt in certain training that I was trying to be broken, like they, because they, they just think we're weaker. Mm. So like, oh, she's gonna cry, she's gonna something, she's gonna, or you know. And so I would just so for me, like it's funny because it goes back to like my heart rate. What we're talking about, like I'm, I'm tough, and and yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm calloused. My, my mind is calloused. My yeah. brain, is, my, my body's calloused. Everything's calloused because, and that's where I need to not like even today when Derek said about you don't got a dog fight. Yeah. But I felt like in my in to get to where I am, there's times where I had to dog fight. You know, I had to grit down, just bear it, and just go. You know, where now I have two coaches that are that um, that get me, they accept me, they understand me, and they're and they know my talent, my abilities, and I'm able to talk about the things that I wasn't able to talk about before. Mm. You know, and I think that having a strength and conditioning coach and a boxing coach, and I had that in California with Haas, you know, Joseph Janik that I won the world two world titles with, um, you know, and Alex Jamora was my strength coach out there, Lauren West who I worked with out there. Mm. I mean, they ha always had. I was very fortunate that they had the good communication, mm. you know, to have that, and I was able to talk about, you know, certain things that I wasn't yeah. able to talk about before. Yeah. But I think, um, you know, they're really, again, like and like you said about the two-minute rounds, three-minute rounds, I mean, there's so much going on with women's boxing now that it's evolving. And I feel like the, pop, the public is now getting educated. I don't necessarily feel that the education is always correct in what they're, what they're getting. Mm -hmm. And they're just assuming things. I think it's really important for females like myself to educate the public in certain certain things. You can't just let, and like just like with the media, you can't just let the media educate you. I, you got to do your research too and, and find out from the from the sources. I would say this because I always say this: I respect women boxers, and so you but don't respect them and judge them within their realm, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not fair. First of all, you know and. We can get into all the politics of what people talk about equality, this and that. But I'm just saying, there are some very awesome women fights. There, there's, there's great women athletes, and they're great within their realm. Yeah. So why are you out there? Why can't you just respect that? Give them their respect for that. Why would you be out there trying to say, oh, but it's not Sugar Ray Leonard Hagler? <laughs> it's not okay. It's not, it's not, it's not meant, to be. meant to be, yeah. right? I'm a man, she's a woman. Mm -hmm. In every aspect of life, mm -hmm. right? And and whether you're talking about relationships, personal relationships, there are good things and things that coordinate for both genders, right? Mm -hmm. Men and women. Mm -hmm. And and so I will just leave it at that. Respect it and judge it within its parameters. Yeah. You know, because I think what happens is when people start trying to compare something or other, they end up inevitably disrespecting yeah. more than they even wanted to. But and the, but that's why I go back to the education. I think that people need to be educated on women's boxing. It is women's boxing. It is different. It's two minute rounds. It's it's not a different sport, but there's definitely a different approach. There's definitely a different style. I would, different I would I would lobby to say it is almost a different sport. You got yeah. to doing the same things, mm -hmm. but. When you look at it, it's different athletes, different time frames, it's different training different systems. Styles. It's the same in that they are doing a combat sport and they are risking their lives. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, last year, we had two. We, I mean, we've had it with the men. And unfortunately, last year, there was two women that passed away due to injuries and, and, and fights. Mm -hmm. So they're risking their life every time they sign the contract, just like the man is. You know, so you got to respect wait, that, doing all that. You know, you, yeah, of course. And that's why know. I think that's why I think like going back to my recovery and everything that you talked about before. Yeah. I think me being on point, but knowing my body. You know, yeah. I don't think you know, I'm 41. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed to say. I wasn't gonna say it. It's but, okay. I don't care. Know. I'm not. I'm not worried about. It. I mean, it's like you know, it's. I'm proud of it though. Yeah. I'm proud that where I am now. I mean, it was funny because I was talking to two of the football, three of the football players that Kaylin was training the day, and they, I was asking them, like, "How old are you? Like, who's in the service? Who's doing college? What grade? Whatever." And then I was like, "I was like, oh," and I was talking. They're looking at me, and I'm like, "Oh, I'm 41." They all dropped. They were like, "No." I'm like, "Yeah," and they were like, "And you're boxing because they've seen me move," and they were just like, "I'm like, yeah." And I think it's listen. I think I, I say this a lot to people. Like, oh, it's genetics, but it's not genetics. It's also the quality of life that I live. Yeah. It's also listen. I'm in a position now, especially as a female fighter. To be able to work, I've tried to get what I have now my whole entire career, where I can financially be independent, 
I can afford to. I don't have to go after sponsors and be running around like a lunatic. Where I can. I know my, my. I know what I need. I know what I have, and I know where I need what I need to. How I need to go. Yeah. So like, I wake up every day. I mean, I can tell you my schedule right now from Monday through Sunday, and I need to have it. And I try to stick to that as best as I can. I make room. There's room for error. There's room for adjustment when it comes to here to work. You know. Um, I know how to say yes, I can. I'm learning how to say no, I can't. Mm-hmm. Does this fit? Like right now, I just got asked to do a radio show, or a, uh, you know, and I'm like, you know, it sounds great. I don't jump on every opportunity because not every opportunity. Okay. It doesn't matter. Even if like, oh, what if they throw money at you? Not all free money is good money. No. You know, sometimes it doesn't work that way. And I've learned that even for myself, but also I understand it working for you. Mm-hmm. You know, and seeing what you go through, and seeing what Derek goes through. You know, mm-hmm. working so closely with you guys and having your own respective businesses and mm-hmm. being able to kind of assist there. Like, then that's where you know I'm. I kind of similar to Derek in that aspect too, where I've learned a lot. You know, I learn. Mm-hmm. I learn. I'm open to. Learn. I don't think I know everything, but I know what I know, and I know what I'm good at. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I say it with the confidence because sometimes as a female, yeah. people and people say they don't look at me. They don't. I said it. Um, Khalil Ali said it to me yesterday, and even the people in, in, the, in the radio show, they're like, "But we don't look at you. We don't see a fighter." And I'm like, "I know." And it, sometimes it's a good thing, mm-hmm. but sometimes it's like. They don't know you that well. Then. Yeah, well, I, I, I think... Well, yeah, well, you guys I, know me. I think two of the major things that are issues in terms of athletes, and, and she mentioned something, the word consistency, right? One, I mean, you have a lot of athletes out there who have been blessed for you know, whatever God's purpose was to give them mm. hands faster or strength faster or processing ability faster. But fighters, a lot of fighters, you know, they, they lack that consistency. They don't want to be in the gym. Look, you don't have to be training as hard or sparring consistently like that, but you definitely have to maintain. Mm. And you see fighters, in, and I'm talking about bare knuckle MMA, men, women, boxing, right? You see them come in and they come in just for training camp or they got a fight and then they're gone for three or four months and nothing can run as efficient as it should regardless of your god-given gifts if you keep stopping and coming back right so sure you're winning because you might be great or something right yeah but just imagine if you had some consistency what you could achieve that's one the other word she used was learning even as a coach right okay I'm 47 years old mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been around boxing my whole life family boxing you know everywhere it's been my passion right I'm still learning I'm still learning one of the biggest problems you know a fighter or a coach can have is that ego right because every fighter is unique and situational as a coach you should be able to learn so i still use as a coach you're still learning you know how to adjust certain things right and how to adjust certain styles of fighting and i I get it you get guys who are so set in their way no this is what we do Mm -hmm. right the only thing i do like that is like say we have a rumble drill right a bag drill that i always do that's more for conditioning Mm -hmm. stamina there's certain basics that I can run the same with everybody else. Then everything else gets creative. Mm. Certain punches, I may change the combination around because it's more natural to him than it it was to to, to him, right? So it has to be individualized. So you're always learning also as a coach, Mm -hmm. you know? And the fighters, no matter how many years they've been in, Mm -hmm. you have to be coachable. Man, you have to be coachable. I know you guys are the stars, and I'm gonna say this, I know you guys are the stars, right? So, because the coach is kind of like the uh, pit crew leader and the fighter's the, the driver, right? You know, the star driver, I get that. But be coachable. There's a reason why I have my job and there's a reason why you do yours. Mm-hmm. I wasn't physically gifted enough to be a star fighter, but my analytics, yeah. my approach has played out to be to be able to be, I did it well enough to where now I'm respected by high level athletes, mm-hmm. right? And they trust me to guide them, right? So that plays out, right? I do my job, 
you do your job. I think that's what makes him a good coach, though, for, for me personally, because I had kind of lost my boxing style for a while. I was mm. really gritting down and just like fighting like a Mexican. Yeah. And I mean, I am Mexican, but you know, I, I'm a very, you know, I'm a very stylistic styler when I, I mean, a uh, fighter when I move and things like yeah. that, and my footwork, and it's very different. And it's funny because somebody saw a video and they were like, "Oh, I didn't know women can fight like that." I'm like, they don't. No. A lot of women don't fight like me, and I can say that with confidence. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll put myself up there and say, "Bring me one that does." You know. It just, it's my own style, but I've developed that style over years of studying, being a student of the game, watching the training, being around fighters like Lomachenko, like Victor Ortiz, like Zab Judah, like Poli Malignaggi. I mean, I can go, even even Camacho Sr., I've seen him move around in the ring. Like, I've seen it all, you know, and I've been around all these amazing athletes to be able to watch and just like in awe, and I've gone to top fights, and I've studied with every fight, you know? People are like, oh, you didn't watch the women. I'm like, no, I didn't watch the women. Number one, the women weren't really, there wasn't that many of them. Yeah, we're and gonna they, watch. And, and they weren't, and, and, I, and I, I don't knock them, but. I, I wanted to, I wanted to, I didn't want to fight like a man. I wanted to fight with that style. I wanted to do what the men were doing and just yeah. figure out, you know, especially Chavez Sr., you know, with his body shots. I mean, I studied mm -hmm. the heck out of him and I did the double on my Instagram of me hitting the body shot. I learned that from studying. Mm -hmm. You know, I literally would go home and just sit there and watch tape, you know, and, and everybody thought I was crazy. Nobody understood. And I kept it really to myself for a long time, you know. Um, but, you know, going back to what, what Derek said about, you know, being coachable, I think. It's not just me being coachable, but a coach having the open mind to let me kind of create a little bit. Because I really yeah. feel like if yeah. they're a fighter, a fighter is an artist. You know, yeah. I'm an artist, you know, and, and I have to be able to, just like, you know, when you do your, your videos, like we talked earlier about being an artist, I think we all have that little element. He's an artist as a coach. You know, you're an artist as a coach. Like, and putting that all together in the ring, I think for me, is like allowing me to create and use my, my abilities and my, my, my vision and what I see. And then yeah. come back to the corner and the coach telling me, okay, I see what you see, but I also see this. Yeah. And yeah. being open to hear that. You know, and then being able to have you hear me in the corner even during fights. I have full on conversations. Yeah. You know, because I'm I'm there a present enough, which is another thing I think fighters really need to work on is being present. Mm -hmm. That doesn't just happen. I remember going through reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, um, trying to figure out how to be present in my personal life and then bring that into the ring in that heightened state. So what I did, I remember I fought in the Alamo Dome on Evander Holyfield's undercard, and it was the perfect opportunity to, fact, to, to practice being present because the ring walk, we had to take, I had to take a golf cart to the ring walk. Mm. Now mind you, I'm fighting a hometown girl. She's a lot bigger than me. Murad Muhammad is the promoter. Evander Holyfield is the main event. Mm. And I'm like, and everybody, they, and at the weigh-ins, it was the real million dollar baby. I was the, you know, and the girl was really big. And I'm like, you know what? Okay, I know me. So I remember getting in that getting in that golf cart and they had me facing back and I saw it was Hector was my coach at the time Hector and Luigi my manager they're walking and I'm in this cart and I'm like I could have let my anxiety and my nerves get me but I was like no I'm here I was like I'm here and I kept saying those words to myself because everybody has their thing and I was like I'm here I'm here and I kept reminding myself so I got to the ring walk we walked to the ring and I remember once I got into that ring and it was packed because my fight was the last fight before the pay per view card came on so the place was the Alamo Dome it was yeah. packed. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, I get into the ring and I looked at Hector and in my head I kept saying, I'm here, I'm here. I was so present in that fight that I could hear the commentators. I was focused. Yeah. I heard the commentators saying my name mm -hmm. and they were, and I was just so there and it was like the most amazing fight <laughs> yeah, because I remembered before. everything. Yeah. 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 And I I've think that before. that's a practice that a fighter There's been times where I haven't to. been and there's been times where I was and I always did great when I was present, like I knowing know. everything. Well, but you on. can practice that in sparring. I feel yeah. like sometimes, and I do, like even today, mm -hmm. I can feel like, listen, this is my second sparring session back. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling more present in this sparring session because I'm able to see things and do what I need to do and make the adjustments that he's saying in the corner. Mm -hmm. Whether you're telling me bring my heart rate down, you know, the little, the, the, uh, you know, the instruction that you gave me too. I'm like, you know what, I took that in, but I'm able to say, okay, but you gotta be able to control your anxiety, control your mind, control your nerves. No, you listen really well. That's that's one, one thing, like if he says something or I say something, you immediately, like when it's, when it's capable of doing it, you do it. Yeah. You know, that's very good. I think elites, for the most part, like having a routine, like you said, being consistent, mm -hmm. Um, and being present in the moment, but also having the ability to learn from mistakes is also very important. I, I'll take that one step further. Being present in general, outside of the gym. <clears throat> Here's another issue that I see with a lot of athletes, right? You have a window, and that's your window because combat sports career is not a lifetime job. Mm -hmm. It is for coaches, maybe, but not for the athlete, right? Not for the active athlete. Yeah. 
So you may have a window that could be anywhere from, you know, back in the days they used to say boxers' careers average were four to eight years. Mm -hmm. That's not a long time. I think it's longer now, um, but that's not a long time. So whether you fight four, five, 10, 15 years, whatnot, right? A lot of fighters, when they leave the gym, they forget that you're in your career, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to get drunk as hell. I'm going to eat all this crap, whatever. I'm going to forget altogether or do things that are sort of counteracting yeah. against what my career is when you're outside of that, right? And again, I'm not trying to be Mr. Prudish, whatnot, you know. Mm -hmm. Have your drink. Have your nice meal here and there. Don't go overboard. I see so much in combat sports, guys are going, it's to an extreme. I think it comes and from, like, being, way back. I think it's come from, like, being an extreme sport, and, I, and I, I've never really been that way, you know. I've never been really extreme, and, like, I mean, you know, having, having had an eating disorder and things like that was one thing, but I never... And self-sabotaging is definitely, that's where the psychological aspect comes in. That's why I felt it was important for me to see it. I mean, I've been in therapy since I was a kid, and therapy's really helped me to understand my character defects and work on those things. But I think, you know, it's sacrifice. I don't think people really understand how much sacrifice. And like I said, I've been doing this for, for 23 years. I've been professional for 16. I've sacrificed so much in my life. I mean, I'm 41, I've never been married, and I have no kids. That was because I've sacrificed. That was because I've gone, I've moved state to state to state for the for, to be in my career yeah. and to learn and grow and adapt and it's like like Derek said like he didn't get here by accident like he put the time in I did the same thing you know and, and I put the time in that's what makes me I think great in the ring is because I understand all those things outside of it and the responsibilities as not just an athlete but as as, as a person and the sacrifices that go into it yeah. and know that I'm only gonna I can't I'm not gonna set myself up to fail mm -hmm. I want to do everything I can to succeed I never look at anything and I tell fighters this even though in any business, in any sport, some things are long term, some things are short term, some things have to be adjusted along the way. <clears throat> Whenever I start working with a fighter, I never think, oh, this is just gonna be one fight, mm -hmm. or this is gonna be, it's always a long, and, but when I approach my own career as a coach, mm -hmm. that's how I looked at it. I never thought like, oh, I'm just gonna coach this one guy, or yeah. I just wanna do this for a little bit, you know, Mm -hmm. And so the approach and every little thing I did sort of kind of went with that, you know, like I was trying to make a career out of it. And I can tell you how many times people told me, no, 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 the sport isn't for that. Hmm. You know, oh, you know, no, no, you're crazy. You're never going to be a professional head coach. You know, no, you're crazy. Oh, it can't happen. Or, you know, just just moonlight here and there yeah. and I was like no I think I have a better ability and mind you like everybody else you have to be realistic right because there's some athletes that don't have it and I, I've had to tell some athletes they're like oh I want to be this and I want to be champion and I'm like man it's just it, it's you don't have that it's not not there you know same thing happens with coaching the same thing can happen in any business or anything you know so it's having a realization of what you're good at yeah. what you're putting your own time into mm -hmm. you know um we all have different skills yeah if your gifts and skills aren't meant to be that then go find what it is <laughs> don't sit talent. there mulling or wasting an athlete's time mm -hmm. to say if you're like half-assing it as a coach right yeah don't waste the athlete's time just because you want to be in the spot or in the show once in a while and you know you want a little bit of light yeah. you know that that's but it's also the athlete's responsibility to recognize that it's they're not getting what they need because yeah. i've been in that position where i said okay I, can, I have to go i have to go like that's why i've switched coaches and it's not because i've ever had bad partings with my coaches it's just that i knew that at that time i got what i needed and but i wasn't always that athlete i used to sit there and be like oh the loyalty because i'm very loyal as you know and i'm like Man, people just leave coaches, but then I realized it's not about it's not personal, and I always what's did best it. for you. And I, but I always yeah. did it with respect. But those coaches that I did it with, they understood. You know, when I went to the coach, but I always had the respect to go to them and say, "Hey, listen, here's the problem that I'm having. Is this something? It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's okay. We have a problem. How can we work together to solve this, or do we not solve it? And then we part ways. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well, obviously we can't solve it, so I'm gonna have to do this, and you can. And they and they were always like, "No, I understand." That's you know? always that's always situational. Look, in this sport. 
I sat back and watched fighters get people in their ear yeah. and move when they shouldn't have moved. And I've also watched fighters be loyal to a fault. Like you said, oh, but well, I started with him. Okay, well, listen, some guys can take you so far, right? Yeah. Your teacher at a certain level could teach you what they could teach. And that, again, that goes in so many different facets, sometimes jobs, some, sometimes you start learning and you're in a department, you learn from your supervisor, but mm -hmm. then you sort of outgrow that, you become better, right? You outgrow that, you get promoted, right? And then you have to leave him behind and you go over him, you get promoted. Um, the same thing sometimes happens with, you know, with coaching, you know? A person might have done good at this or that, but they can't put the whole thing together. Mm -hmm. So then you have to move, you know? And then there's the guys who know that they can't teach you all that mm -hmm. or they can't help you, but then they'll, you know, try to drape you with the whole loyalty to sure. a fault thing. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be, you know, to a certain point as an athlete, you should be loyal when you need to be loyal, right? You should be loyal, but mature enough to also understand yeah. when somebody's just trying to fleece me for their own good. You know, they you know, like it he's not helping me. He wanted me to carry him. Yeah. It happens with coaches. Coaches go through that. Boxes go through it. I mean, it just it's just interesting. But you know who's the most protected? Promoters and managers, which I think is hysterical. Co boxes and coaches aren't protected. Well, but, you know, and, you know, and, a lot of times in boxing, they're more protected with contracts or whatever. The the coaching profession other. is the least protected of all. Yeah there's service contracts and most of the time those service contracts can be defeated anywhere hmm. you know I always tried to work with the you know honesty policy I tell the manager you know hey sometimes I need to get so much money until your guy gets promoted yeah. because hey I have to live too mm -hmm. can't do every I can't do it for free you know yeah. Um, and then, you know, when it's time, it's, you know, 10%, and you hope that the fighter and the manager, because it, there's been times where it's happened to me where they've not paid me yeah. either my money or the percentage of money that's supposed to be. Um, that's really a shame mm -hmm. because usually, you know, as a fighter, I think that, and this happens sometimes with some fighters, and, I don't, you know, you, you guys have to really think about this as a fighter. When you're making a little bit of money, Mm. and your coach is just making a small percentage of that little bit of money. I cannot be on your back every moment going, this isn't worth it for me. This yeah. sucks, this and that, right? So I'm doing my job, mm. right? So when I'm getting my 10% and you're making five grand and, and that's $500, unless the manager is helping me out with a salary, that's not a whole lot of money when we're talking about the amount of time yeah that you have to put into an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. So when that athlete now is making 250,000, mm -hmm. right? And he goes, oh, okay, you know, I gotta pay the coach 25,000, mm -hmm. or he's making 300,000, I gotta pay the coach 30,000, you'll get a lot of fighters go, man, oh, that's a lot of money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just have integrity, yeah. have integrity. You've been blessed. You got there. You're making six figures, Don't whatnot. Who you get there too. Have integrity. You pay who you supposed to pay, all the way down. Whether it's your cut man, yeah. whether it's your trainer, your assistants, your employees. Have integrity. And then you know, if you want to make a change later on, that's fine. You know, but just have the integrity to do the right thing. And I've run into that situation a few times. Luckily. You know, it hasn't happened much, but it's running a few times, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, he forgot about the three years he didn't make any money, and we were winning, and, yeah. you know, I was yeah. like, he's going to make it. You know, yeah. he's going to make it. And when he made it, it became, like, hey, mm -hmm. you know, can I pay you less? Or this isn't enough, you know? Yeah, it could be disheartening as a coach, you know, bringing yeah. a guy up at that level and then knowing that, okay, we're going to make it to this certain level and we'll be able to be good, and then he all, all of a sudden leaves you. I'll tell you, being, being kind of like, I always say like the fly on the wall, because as a female, we were never like, in the, you know, back then, now it's different. Back mm -hmm. then, it was like, oh, like they forget we're there. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been a blessing for me, because I've learned so much being the fly on the wall, yeah. and seeing what happened, and knowing like, man, like, 
I mean, it's it's been good for me in the business and it's been bad for me. I've learned a lot because now I can help advise fighters. I've managed a fighter. Yeah. I know the ins and outs and things. But I also sat back. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I never want to do that. I don't ever want. I don't. You know, I have integrity and no. I appreciate people's time. And I've always said it to you. I've said it to Derek how much I appreciate. Um. And, you know, what can I do? You know, like because. You know, and even even financially, because women, we didn't make a lot of money, or we don't make that much money. Like, what can I do? You know, what else can I help you with? You know, what I'm yeah. saying, is there something that I can do for you? You know, whether it's like you know, connect you with somebody or something like that. Like, what can I do? And I think that that's important. So that's a word to all the young fighters out there. You know, I just follow appreciation. The, follow it goes, the ones that it have goes, been there. It, yeah, I mean, it goes it goes a long way. It just go, appreciation goes a long way. Um, gratitude goes a long yeah. way, and just doing the right yeah. thing goes a long way. Do things know? that make sense. You know, yeah. assess your situations. <clears throat> Realize when you're in the wrong place. And don't waste years in the wrong place either. Sure. You know. Yeah. And listen, with the accessibility that you guys have now with Instagram, and like I said, I'm I, I I'm accessible, you know, and and I you know I and people I've had fighters come and ask me for advice, like what would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? And you know, I've helped guide some fighters and just said, hey, this is what happened with me. I don't tell people what to do. But yeah. I'll say, hey, I if I've seen that situation, I've been in that situation. I'm like, well, here are your options, and then ultimately you make the decision. Well, with that being said, <laughs> you gotta go yes, train, gotta train, and also. Mm -hmm. Let them know where they can find you on Instagram, YouTube, Derek, and the, and the gym. So, Derek, you go ahead first. You can find me at uh, Derek Santos Boxing Trainer. Um, you can also find our gym at DS Boxing Gym. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I, I put things that's more a little more personal for me. Um, the Instagram is more the business, but you can find me at Derek Santos Rosario, which is in Latin countries, they use both of your last names, so Rosario is my mother's maiden name. Hmm. Um, that's why I put it there, respect to, to my family. Um, so you can find us there. And uh, you know, thank you all for supporting and appreciating uh, our athletes. I'm Maureen underscore Shay on Instagram and Facebook, Maureen the Real Million Dollar Baby Shay, Twitter Maureen Shay, TikTok Maureen Shay. Snapchat morning today. <laughs> I gotta keep up with this one. <laughs> good luck. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> you good, right? All right, well, thanks. <laughs>